I think the time has come. We're going to start. You can continue enjoying your lunch. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us this afternoon. And we're fortunate to have gathered a group of distinguished colleagues of ours who have served on review panels at different agencies. And oftentimes, you'll see a lot of information in RFPs, requests for proposals. But there's also a lot of insight that you have to have uh, in terms of how the review panels discuss different proposals. What is the dynamics? And they're going to take time to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what funding agency they have served on, what programs they've been affiliated with, and share three or four tips with you because we don't have a whole lot of time. And then after that, we will start an open discussion session. You can raise your hand because this session is being recorded. In order to capture your question, I would appreciate it if you can raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you and then we will have the panel members, the appropriate panel members, answering those questions for you and we can elaborate on that. So with that, we can start at this end and uh, let's start with our provost, Dr. Rodriguez, and he will introduce himself and, and tell you a little bit about uh, the funding agency that he has been involved in serving on the review panels, and then we'll move on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to, to be here, and I appreciate that uh, Dr. Shah's office and Dr. Kubash's office have put this uh, uh, workshop together, and I appreciate the, uh, the participation, uh, and so thank you for being here. Uh, uh, as a researcher, and I'll be speaking to you more as a researcher than anything else, uh, I've had the opportunity to serve on a variety of uh, review panels uh, for the National Science Foundation, for the Ford Foundation, internal and external grant uh, funding uh, as well. And so for me, one of the key aspects here that I want to highlight, and now as provost and many of you know, I've always uh, talked about the need to really focus on your scholarship and develop uh, grant proposals to fund your scholarship, both internal and external grant proposals. So I think this is particularly important to enhance and strengthen your portfolio and to really uh, produce uh, a better and greater scholarship that will allow you uh, to enhance your professional development. And of course, it always helps for promotion and tenure. I would encourage you as you think about developing proposals, you can start with small internal uh, seed grants that you can do, bin, then build those proposals uh, to seek out uh, external uh, funding. I always like to highlight as a reviewer that interdisciplinary research uh, is particularly important. So no matter what discipline you come from, interdisciplinary research can get a foot uh, in the door. Many of the review panels and funding agencies are indeed looking uh, for uh, interdisciplinary research. Competitive proposals are, are critical and are important, and the team that you put together is also critical. So I would encourage you to uh, seek mentors, faculty mentors, who have experience with external funding, who have been successful, and engage them in developing your grant proposals. And so if you have little to no experience, having a senior person who has extensive experience is going to be key. Remember there's diverse sources of funding for your scholarship, from local, state, federal, uh, grants to uh, foundations to disciplinary associations that fund uh, research to uh, industry and others that you can look at for your funding. Remember, you can get almost anything funded, quite literally, from exploratory research to basic research, quick response grants, travel, uh, developing conferences for your university, engaging students in undergraduate research, student success, you name it, there's probably a funding agency out there that will be willing to provide funding for you if you develop a competitive proposal. <coughs> Start early and develop your proposal uh, with sufficient lead time and not a week or a few days before because you will certainly uh, be in trouble. If you get rejected, don't panic, don't worry. Review the comments from your reviewers, resubmit your proposal and make it a much better and stronger proposal. Your proposal should be reviewed internally by your colleagues, by your mentors before you submit the proposal uh, for funding. Make your proposal concise, to the point, and provide all the necessary information. Reviewers need to know what you want to do, why you want to do it, what's the impact, and how much will it cost. That is, how much funding you're, request, you're requesting. Always know your audience. 
at times interdisciplinary teams will be reviewing your proposal so they need to understand what you're saying so trying to avoid all the jargons associated with our disciplines is going to be key and finally i would strongly encourage you to serve on review panels uh, there are agencies national science foundation nih you name them they are looking for faculty to serve on review panels for example, uh, I submitted uh, a proposal to the National Science Foundation for research experience for undergraduate. It got rejected. I listened to their comments, submitted it again. It got rejected. I called the program officer. I said, I want to serve on the review panel. I served on the review panel, got to know the panelists, got to know what they were looking for. They got to know me. You get to know the program officer. I then resubmitted my proposal for RU funding, and it got funded. So knowing who your audience is, knowing what the expectations are, is critical. I'll stop here. Okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Maria Elena Reyes. Uh, I have uh, worked uh, with as a reviewer for various uh, federal agencies, primarily the U.S. Department of Education. I've also uh, been a reader for other agencies. Uh, this is over a period of the last 15 years. Uh, my recommendations are as following. Are as following. I always recommend that you seek larger proposals. I've written myself written proposals at, at various amounts, and it takes just as much time and effort to run a uh, manage a $300,000 proposal than it does to manage a $1.5 million proposal. Uh, uh, read the request for proposals carefully. Write the proposals to address each priority listed. Have a senior tenured person on your team who has experience being awarded and implementing a grant from the agency. Uh, remember that under the current administration, uh, innovation and creativity are valued. Um, um, Arnie Duncan has said, uh, I know that when he, he gave a talk to one of the panels I was working on, he, he wanted us to be very careful in awarding the people's money. So uh, he takes that seriously, and he, he always honors the recommendations from the, from the panelists. <laughs> uh, put together a proposal that makes sense, is well written, and make sure that each person on your team is capable of making a significant contribution, both in writing and implementing the grant. Don't get too fancy. Don't make it complicated. When you get a, a simply written but solid proposal, these proposals float to the top. <laughs> Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Patty Feria. I'm in biology department, and I will talk about NIH. So uh, briefly, I have to mention I've been, I have participated in national and international proposals and been uh, successful getting money from both uh, national and international. But now talking about the NIH, I just want to share. It's very important to contact the program director. So. You start with that and get input, talk about your ideas, and they will give you the best advice. In my case, I contact the director, pro, uh, program director, and she even suggests a workshop that we can attend for this NIH that is uh, exclusively for underrepresented universities. So the good, uh, a lot of good things about this workshop, but something that is very important, they give you an example, a proposal that actually got money. So that is very good. And then you, uh, you work and you were in the panel. You review the proposal and you learn how. You have to review significance, investigators, innovation, approach, environment, and what exactly you need to look at. How scores from one to nine actually work and how even having sometimes non-scores, you can go, uh, your proposal can be discussed. How even having scores that were Nine being not the best, but the worst, actually. Sometimes they discuss also your proposal. So don't get discouraged and, uh, and try this. Contact the program director. If you need information about the workshop, I will be very happy to give you. Actually, the next workshop is going to be in May. They pay for you to go. You have to write to be competitive enough for, for them to go and, uh, and select you to go to this workshop. But then they can help you to review the proposal there. And if you have a proposal that was rejected, they can help you to write how you need to 
improve all this writing to resubmit. And they are doing that all at the same time there. And uh, finally, seek out guidance from the OSPI early. So you will be happy like when you go and ask for the help. So, and if you know that the deadline is September and it's already February, I will recommend go, start, talk to the person in the SPR office. They're very nice, they're gonna help you and they're gonna guide you. And if something they don't know by chance, they will review so you have everything submitted on time. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is uh, Stephen Tidrow. I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Innovative Education in the College of Science and Mathematics. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is uh, helping you to uh, level the playing field for a wide variety of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, departments. Uh, in particular, I used to be a, a reviewer and still am a reviewer at times for the Department of Defense, uh, Department of Energy. I've reviewed for NSF and as well as other organizations. Um, of course, not all organizations are made the same, so NFS is a, a little bit different. NIH is probably a little bit different, but many of the other departments, they have specific goals in mind for their research as you're really supporting their infrastructure. For instance, uh, what I would suggest to you is make your research relevant and submit to a specific program manager. For instance, if the Department of Defense comes out with a broad agency announcement and there are 25 different programs, you better identify your program, you better contact your program manager, you better speak with the program manager if there are monies within your college to go see the program manager and have a face-to-face. -face. Or if you go to a conference and you know a program manager is going to be there, uh, ask them if they might have time to sit down at lunchtime or dinner. Uh, don't, of course, offer them to buy their uh, dinner or lunch. <laughs> they, they can't uh, accept, but they will uh, most often uh, be more than happy to join you at uh, lunch or dinner and discuss uh, topics of uh, mutual interest. Okay, so uh, again, take a trip to the program manager facilities, uh, uh, talk, talk with them at conferences, and then of course another thing that you need to know is to interact with their bench level scientists. For instance, the Department of Defense, uh, there's the Army Research Laboratory, Naval Research Laboratory, Air Force Research Laboratory, those support the various DOD branches of the government. They also have a research office that is in charge of research external. So that's the Office of Naval Research, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and the Army Research Office. They're associated and affiliated, and so if you want to make an impact, you might want to try to get in a summer program to go to one of those facilities, where it's the Air Force Research Laboratory, Army Research Laboratory, Naval Research Laboratory, get to know their bench level scientists, get to know what's relevant to their needs, and that's what you have to propose toward. So the, you'll have a BAA out, and it's a broad agency announcement, basically giving you an overview of what they're interested in, but to get the details of their interest is very important for you to level the playing field for yourself. Okay. The other thing is develop an outstanding abstract. Okay. If your abstract is here and there, guess what happens within your proposal? It's here and there also. So when your abstract is focused, you will get everybody's attention so that they're wanting, not only having to, but wanting to read your proposal to find out what <coughs> solution you have to bring to their table. Okay? And then the final thing that most faculties don't do, and we need to, we at this institution need to do a better job of that, is understanding that we can recommend <coughs> those that Review, review our proposals, okay? And you can also disqualify some people from reviewing your proposal. So there's always a section that you can recommend people that are adequate knowledge to review your proposal, and you can also identify people that may not uh, um, be receptive to your proposal just because there may be some kind of conflict, okay? So those are the... Uh, major things I think that can help level the playing field for people writing proposals, just to understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Let me make a couple of comments and then we'll open it up for a discussion. Uh, just to let you know, if you're interested in collaborating with scientists in the Army Research Laboratories, or DOD in particular, 
I have sent an Excel sheet out to the associate deans in your respective colleges responsible for uh, the research part of it. You have to provide the information to them so that we can create a database that we will be sharing with the Office of Federal Relations of the UT system and they are interfacing that with the Army Research Laboratories to identify where there might be a match and overlap in our interests so that you can start that relationship and eventually it will lead to potentially some funding. Once you build that relationship with those scientists over there, you collaborate in research, then they will certainly be doing the review of your proposal. They will be recommending you for that funding. So just be aware of that and if you're interested, reach out to your associate deans in your respective colleges. Okay. The other comment I wanted to make just to kind of build on, um, having a conversation with your program officer, there's another aspect of it too that you have to keep in mind. You want to contact them before you start writing your proposal. Share your idea with them and after you have carefully read the request for proposal, don't just call and start talking about stuff that is already spelled out in the request for proposal. They do not like that. You read that carefully, reach out to them, and tell them what is your idea that you are thinking about proposing. And if they tell you that, yeah, that's an idea that we would be interested in considering. And if they're not interested in it, there's no fit, they will tell you up front, we don't fund that idea. So you haven't really spent any time. There's no waste of time here. Because if you write it and submit it and then after the fact you find out, well, that really didn't match what they were looking for. So find out in the beginning. You don't have to go through a lot of details, but at least in general terms, get a feel for it. If the program officer is interested in entertaining your proposal, then you go ahead and write it. So let me pause here and open it up for questions. So, so let, me, let me just break the ice here and ask the question. Anybody can answer this. Now, as far as contacting the program officer is concerned, that's a double-edged sword. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, well, with me, the largest grant that I got was a $1.5 million grant, and I, I, I didn't contact the program officer, but it was a, one of the most highly uh, rated uh, proposals that had been submitted to the department. Um, and it was really strange because when they called me to make the award, they made a statement, something like, uh, do you have enough money to do what you want to do? And I made the mistake of saying yes. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so should you ever be asked that question, just take a minute to think about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I, be, I, I think the department was, had been willing to fund at a higher level. And by me saying yes, this is all, I can do it with this amount. Um, I kind of closed that door. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, this is Hiram Moya in Manufacturing Engineering. So one of the uh, issues I've heard is that, you know, yes, it makes the same amount of work to manage big projects versus small projects. Yet uh, I hear that agencies, particularly like NSF, uh, don't want to fund huge projects because they would rather fund you know, more people or they have limited resources and it's still shrinking. So on the NSF perspective, it, it, what is your feeling about that, about the size of the proposals from an engineering perspective? I would say that it really depends on your background and your expertise, right? If this is the first time you're writing a grant proposal and you don't have the background and the expertise, it's going to be uh, particularly difficult to convince uh, your program office or the review panel that you have the knowledge, background, expertise to uh, carry out a $2 million or $3 million or $4 million uh, proposal. However, if you've gotten uh, significant funding in the past, uh, I would encourage you to uh, go uh, and, and apply for a larger proposal. I can give you concrete example, when I arrived at UT Pan American, we were focusing on developing an NSF uh, grant, and Dr. Kabash and I were talking, and he uh, was asking me, should we submit an application to uh, NSF for the advanced program, which was a $250,000 grant. My response was, that's going to be as much work as a, a $3 million grant, and I think we've got the background and the expertise uh, to the go for the larger grant. So we submitted the larger grant for $3.1 million, and, uh, and we got the grant. 
map, but we could show that we had the background, the knowledge, the foundations for those types of grants. So I would encourage you, if you don't have the background or the experience, uh, to start small and then start building it up. But as was previously said, you know, a $200,000 grant is not easier to manage than a $3. million grant, right? And so there are some benefits here and there, but that is key. And I would just like to go back to the program officer uh, issue. I think it's important uh, and good for you to co pro, uh, contact your program officers. And again, you have to be careful about the type of information that you're providing or what you're requesting. They're there to help. What some folks don't know also is that program officers, especially at NSF, among other agencies, have discretionary amounts of funding uh, to provide uh, special funding for special projects that do not require a request for uh, proposals. So when I was at the University of Delaware, I was director of the Disaster Research Center. I wanted to do an international uh, research conference to celebrate the 45th anniversary of the Disaster Research Center. So I contacted a program officer. Uh, he liked the idea. He asked me to submit a, a proposal. And he internally funded that with discretionary funding that, that, that they had. So that's becoming even uh, in shorter supply, if you will, but there are also opportunities out there. So I think it's key uh, to contact your program officer, but proceed with caution. Right. right. So, and if I can yes. add a little bit also in my participation in panels, we evaluate uh, the scientific merit, see the overall merit, and when we are reviewing that, is there is a question about does the budget See, the budget, the amount of money you're asking, actually, with that money, would you address the questions? So if your question is so small and you just want to do like a small survey versus you want to answer the big question, then that you need to, to have that balance. So uh, what, are you, what is your question, your research question, and uh, the budget, what are you asking for? So, so, so let, me, let me add to these uh, uh, very important comments that were made with regard to the budget. <clears throat> uh, you do want to start small, but if the RFP spells out the upper limit, then you should go for the full amount. And you want to build a credible team, uh, multidisciplinary team, so you look like you have the credibility and you, you are dependable, you can deliver on it. Mm -hmm. So if the upper limit is $300,000 and you say, well, my chances will be better if I ask 50000 that's not necessarily so. It, it depends upon, as the provost pointed out, your credibility and your talent and what you have to offer. But don't go for the uh, center proposal for $5 million if you have not had any grants in the past. You want to build start, start small and then build it up. But I just want to highlight, as Patty said, there's got to be a strong correlation between yes. your goals and objectives and your research plan and what you're requesting because what you're requesting says a lot about you, right? And so if you're requesting funding that will not allow you to achieve those goals and objectives, that's not going to get you funded. And if you submit a budget that's uh, inflated, people will realize that immediately and your proposal will not get funded. Yeah. So also... The program officer can contact you and say, we have this money. Can you adjust your budget so you can see if you can modify that budget? So I asked money for two years, and they said, we have money for a year, one year, and this amount of money. Can you adjust your budget? You, that, that, it could be also something that happened. OK, let's see if there are other questions. Yes, back there. I'm very interested in becoming a reviewer for grants, and I wondered about the costs associated with that. So I was asked if, uh, several years ago, and I knew that they were convening in another city, and are all the travel and hotel, is, is everything covered by the funding agency if you agree to be a reviewer? I, I had, I've had a very wonderful, one of my most rewarding uh, professional experiences has been serving as a reviewer. And uh, the, the most memorable was serving in the Race to the Top, uh, which is the signature competition, uh, uh, Obama's com uh, competition for the, for it in education in 2010. And that had a three and four billion dollar pot of money. And uh, when you have to be competitive, 
you submit, uh, and I actually, I, I offer this advice to all my colleagues. Uh, you, you just write in the US DOE website, just, just type in reviewer, and then they'll send you a little questionnaire about your research interests. Um, for a highly competitive uh, competition like Race to the Top, uh, you are, you will be, it's a national pool. And so you're working with people that are like commissioners of education, uh, some really uh, heavyweights in education, and it's very rewarding. Uh, you all travel expenses are paid for. What I learned is when Congress makes um, um, <coughs> approves a certain fund, right off the top, is the, the each federal agency takes money to pay for travel and for the review process, which is very important. Uh, interacting with top educators from all over the world was, was a very rewarding experience for me. Uh, I met lots of people who were retired, who actually was almost a full-time job for them to be to serve as reviewers. So it's it's a it's a wonderful uh, professional opportunity, and I urge you, whatever your discipline is, uh, to to put your name in the in the in the hat, you know. And I think you, you'll find the experience extremely rewarding. So, and I would like to add here that you don't need to travel to be a reviewer. You can be a ad hoc a reviewer from mm -hmm. NSF, for example. So you get the proposals, you review in your office, you send back the comments, uh, and it's something that I just yeah. wanted to add. Yeah. You don't need to yeah. travel, yeah. Right. so you That's can right. review also. Mm -hmm. and, and just to highlight before people start uh, sending out your uh, request for reviewers, <laughs> uh, federal agencies typically will not uh, give you any stipend right. for, for being a reviewer. I mean, this is part of professional service. Uh, so NSF, NIH, Ford Foundation, etc. you will not get a stipend for serving as a reviewer. However, if they do convene a panel and you do have to travel to the site, they will cover your expenses and they have their own uh, guidelines as to what expenses are covered and how and to what amounts. Right. Okay, any other questions? I see a hand in the back, no? So let me throw a question out. <clears throat> you know, um, sometimes people have a tendency that they assume that all review panel members are well versed in that particular field. Can you comment on that a little bit? From, from my experience, um, like when I talk to my colleagues sometimes, uh, it takes me a long time to get my point across. For, for, for me to make my thoughts when my colleagues here at the university understood, and I find it's exactly reversed when I go up to D.C. and serve on these panels. <laughs> it's like they have to wait for me to kind of get what they're saying. <laughs> so, I don't know. And it all depends on the it all depends on the, the the type of funding that you're requesting, right? Some are very knowledgeable about your discipline, et cetera. But to give you uh, two examples, the National Science Foundation Research Experience for Undergraduates and the National Science Foundation Advanced Program, they convene panels that are, are very broad in terms of their disciplines. So they include sociologists and psychologists. Uh, just recently, uh, Dr. Kavaj served on the NSF Advanced Panel, uh, and he's an engineer, and so he's talking to psychologists, sociologists. So your, uh, your panel can be, 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 be very heterogeneous in terms of their academic background and experiences. So again, my initial point was you need to know your audience and who's going to be in that panel, not the exact people, but sort of what types of persons uh, and uh, faculty or researchers serve on those panels. That's critical. So, so let me make one additional comment along those lines. From my personal experience, I would read the proposal and one or two I would stumble on and I would struggle with understanding and I would say, hmm, what are they trying to tell me? And I would come to the conclusion that it's probably me who doesn't understand it. And then you go to the panel, everybody's sitting there, everybody's expert in that field, and then you find out other people have exactly the same experience. And that's because you didn't try to come down to the level to communicate and organize your proposal in a way, in a thoughtful way, so that they can understand. If you start to use a lot of acronyms and jargon, you're going to lose them right away. If you lose their interest, they're not going to read the rest of the proposal very carefully. And they are not going to fight for you at the panel. The reviewers you will find, if you serve on a panel, that some of them will be 
convinced by your proposal to the point that they will fight for you. And then there will be others who are not compelled by your arguments, and they will try to kill it for you. So you don't know either one of them, but somebody's trying to fight for you there. Yes. Uh, in the case of the NIH, you actually can go and uh, see the study sections and see who is uh, uh, what, who are the reviewers that are in the study sections because the reviewers are there for four or six years. So they've been there for several years and they're probably going to be there this, this year. You can see in parentheses that says the year when they're going to finish the service. There are people finishing in 14, 2014, others 2017, but you can actually select the study section where you want to submit. Not in the case of a score proposals, uh, the CSC uh, proposals, not, not that case, that w go to their programs. But if they go to the Center for Science, Scientific Review, then you can uh, select the study section. The other point to keep in mind for the panel is that they all want to keep the diversity there on the panel. They want to have uh, minorities as well as uh, female uh, members there. So take advantage of that. And Hispanic serving institutions, we should take advantage of that. Yes, back there, there's a question. So uh, that's an interesting point about the, the diversity of people on the panel, and, and you don't want to pitch the level of your proposal too high, so that some of the people um, don't follow it and and uh, don't don't respect it. But what about the other side? Is there a danger? that you, you write the proposal too simplistically and, and some people say that uh, the, the applicant doesn't know what they're talking about. It, it, um, and, so, and so how how would you try to pitch it at the best level or, or which is more important to avoid? Um, pitching it too high or pitching it too low? Anybody I think want to that, that, that depends upon yeah. your audience again. Mm -hmm. If you're at, uh, for instance, in your you go to the Department of Defense, program managers already have a, a group of people they rely upon that are experts in the area and you want to be pitching it at a relatively high level. If you're going to NSF, you could have, depending upon the program review, you could have a wide variety of, of people there. Now, if the program is specifically focused in a specific area in engineering or in science or, or okay, in biology or chemistry, and uh, you have to pitch it kind of at a mid-range because that panel could still be a wide range of chemists or biologists or uh, physicists or, okay. So it depends upon your audience and what, who, who is the program manager and what that program is specifically uh, there to, to accomplish, right. okay. In the case of the NIH, they are going to review the different significant investigators and if you didn't you didn't go too, too, in too much detail about innovation, but you're advancing the field. See, there are things that need to be reviewed. They, they have to be reviewed. Three people will be in charge to give you this course. Uh, well, everybody's reviewing the proposals, but three are going to be in charge. 20, 30 people, uh, I'm sorry, about 20, 25 people are meeting so, uh, to discuss. It's like, and the opinion of everybody needs to be heard. So I think that the audience, I agree with everybody, but keep in mind one part in the case of Dana H. Seems that it's not fitting there, but the others get high score. You have chance to, to pass, uh, the, the proposal can pass for discussion. In the U.S. Department of Education, they want, they want to see clearly written proposals. Most of the panelists will be experts on the field, and if it's poorly written or it's uh, proposing something that's a little outrageous, it, they're going to start laughing or something, <laughs> and it won't get funded. But you want to write it where it's accessible and readable and well-written, clearly written. And I should highlight that really the only way you know that is uh, 
I, I, I encourage you, strongly encourage you, before you submit a proposal to an external agency, have it reviewed by your peers, yes. uh, uh, the folks that specialize in your discipline. If you know that this is a broad panel that uh, uh, crosses several disciplines, well, if you're an engineer, uh, have your folks, uh, your colleagues in education and in sociology review your proposals. Get internal comments because, you know, the comments of your peers at the institution may indeed reflect the comments at the, at the uh, foundation level. So getting that feedback from your peers uh, at the institutional level or uh, across the country is going to be critical to the success of your proposal. So let me add one more comment to address your uh, question. If you are applying for funding for basic research, chances are pretty high that there are going to be other chemists or physicists or engineers at that level. So you got to talk at that level. But if you're applying for applied research, then it's going to be a diverse pool. And you can further uh, say if it's a program that requires um, perspectives from different disciplines, then it's, there's going to be even further diversity in that. So you have to kind of know, as uh, Dr. Tedrow pointed out, as to what your audience is going to be. And, and of course, again, on every proposal, you should be putting in people you think that should be on a review panel mm -hmm. and people that you think should be disqualified from the review panel. Um, you might be surprised that some of those people actually may be reviewing your proposal. I will add that sure, sure. it's very important in my case, I have been very important to go and talk to people who already got grants because they can advise you. They can really give you an advice for things that you didn't know that you could do and actually wouldn't be that complicated. And if you find that the person you think that person is not going to give you because sometimes I have even uh, uh, people have provide uh, examples of proposals that were funded and that is be very helpful to have proposals that were funded. It's not your field. You're not going to copy the idea, right? But you're going to see the example of how uh, uh, the proposal looks like and for you. So go with people that. Yeah, okay. I just want to say one thing. Like the provost, I just came back from the a panel review on the National Science Foundation and what Steve mentioned about the abstract is really important mm -hmm. because the reviewers read the abstract and either they get more interested or they just basically from the first you know few lines like they read the letter from you know mm -hmm. from the headline so this is really key another focus basically is ensuring that you have an innovative idea and a unique idea because we always discuss what's unique about this proposal what distinguish this proposal from the other mm -hmm. and in this case talking with the program officer is really key because in some cases we find that the program officer is answering some of the questions of the panel because he already talked with the PI and, and the people and the, he, you know, they, they are, you know. So this is, these all key things. Now I just want to mention actually one of our colleagues actually he came to me now and Dr. Isaac Chautabal and he told me he just received an email right now that he got funded for $330,000 from the Office of Air Force Research. So. All right. So this panel is paying off. So I'm going to ask him to tell us, you know, did he talk with the program <laughs> officer, you know? So he just received, yes. actually, and he came to me very excited. So I want him just to, <laughs> <laughs> he just received it right well, away this it. moment. So I, I, I just received an email from the uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Uh, they just said, let me read that email. I said, uh, dear Dr. Chautafal, it is a pleasure to inform you that uh, it is a pleasure to inform you that your proposal, uh, mm. vortex dynamics and uh, boundary layer characteristics, is being recommended for sponsorship. And then they went on to say uh, some other things. But so uh, I talked with the uh, uh, program officer before I submitted the proposal. And uh, actually, last summer I went to the Wright Patterson Air Force Base as a summer faculty and. Uh, that is where I established uh, a relationship with the uh, program officer. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and then uh, last year, I submitted my proposal under the broad agency announcement of uh, Air Force so, uh, that's, that's Congratulations. Congratulations. Great. <laughs> I just want to highlight that given the, the sure. focus on, on program officers, there are some program officers that have as a policy, perhaps an unwritten policy, that they will not talk to anyone. 
And so you also have to understand that. Uh, at the National Science Foundation, there are program officers that will talk to you, and there are program officers that will not talk to you because they feel that they're giving you an unfair advantage right. by talking to you. So you have to be cognizant of that. If you don't get a response from your program officer, it doesn't mean that they don't like you or your proposal or your ideas. They've just uh, followed that as a, as a general guideline. Yeah. And second of all, remember, uh, so what we have to understand is for some of these panel reviews, uh, panelists are sometimes reviewing 40, 50, yes. 70, 100, <laughs> 200 proposals, right? And so you want to get your foot in the door. And again, as Dr. Kubaj and Dr. Tidro said, that abstract uh, can make or break your proposal. And if I'm reading your proposal and by page two, I still don't have an idea of what you want to do, your proposal is in grave danger of not getting funded. So please keep that in mind. Yeah. Let me add one more comment to that. Reviewers, when they receive, let's say, 10, for example, they will go through the abstracts and just browse through the pages and see which one is easier for me to review first. So they will start with that first. They want to leave the most difficult one that they may have a hard time understanding or it's not well organized last. Just remember, they get only two weeks to review and submit their comments. They're, this is very intense time. So by the time they get to the one that's the most difficult one, they're pretty tired. So you can kind of use your imagination as to what may happen with it. So be careful that writing it carefully, articulate your points clearly is very important. Yes. Uh about the workshop that I mentioned, and I, if you need information, I will be happy. So you can find my email in biology department, Teresa Feria. But they actually, you can sub send the proposals. They will review the <coughs> English and all the ideas in general, but based on how you, the sentence look like a sentence that go straight, that, that uh, make uh, the reader to be interested, because we know that we, the question, the ideas for research we have are um, so exciting, and sometimes when we are writing uh, and somebody is reading, it doesn't look like exciting. But in this case, we can have help to 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 uh, arrange that uh, sentence to make it more interesting. I'd, I'd like to add two more things. Sure. Uh, there are program managers can talk to you at specific times, and then once certain things happen, they can no longer talk to right. you. Right. So you really want to get hold of a program. So if you know something's coming out every year from NSF or NIH or Department of Defense, you want to be talking to the program manager at least nine months in advance before a BAA actually hits the street and try to get some understanding of what their interests are because that BAA is going to come out and their interests aren't really going to change. But once that BAA comes out, they have have to limit as to what they can talk about now, okay? So once the BAA is out, that's an advertisement, and they have limited things that they can discuss with you, okay? Before that, you can actually be helping a program manager maybe to build the next program that the program manager will have, that's right. okay? And then that gives you a little bit of an extra up, no guarantees that your proposal will be successful, but it gives you an in in the door. But it's still up to you to write a very clear proposal. And again, the key is the abstract to get the reader interested. And of course, after that, it also has to be a polished uh, piece of work, okay, that, that has some innovation in it, okay, some creativity, and, and some new results that will likely come from it. Last thing I'd like to say is that once you do get your first grant funded, be sure you deliver product on time yes. and at cost. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because if yes. you don't, program managers do talk. And program managers, even though they are recommended by the panel, program managers also have an input, and their directors have an input, and it can always get pulled out for other reasons. It can also be funded sometimes for other reasons as well. Okay? But that depends upon the discretion of what they are allowed to do. Some organizations, that's not so allowable. Other organizations, it may be more allowable. 
let me just follow up on what Dr. Tidjo said regarding if you get funded. Uh, as someone who has been funded by the National Science Foundation, every time I submit a grant to the National Science Foundation, a proposal to the National Science Foundation, they have a section in which I have to put uh, previous funding received from the National Science Foundation, and I have to talk about the outcomes of that research, the contributions, and the impact of that research. So that and that's going to count towards those folks deciding whether I will get funded again or not. So you've got to be very careful once you get a proposal. Uh, the good news is you got funded. The bad news is you got funded. So now you're committed uh, to doing what you promised, right, with the funding that you requested uh, and following uh, the, the guidelines established by the foundation. So for our colleague in the back who just received the notice of award, this is the first time for you with this agency to establish your credibility. If you deliver, as everybody pointed out, on time, as promised, successfully, you, you are in the door now. The next round you submit a proposal, they can count on you, you're going to deliver. So they will fund you. The minute they see you have trouble delivering on what you promised, then your chances of getting money the second time around goes down. That credibility is very important. So it's important not to ask for no-cost extensions for no reason. It has to be a justifiable reason. Okay? Any other questions here? Yes. As we uh, transition to the new university, what's the panel's uh, opinion as to mentioning that within the narrative, briefly mentioning the transition? What, what's your opinion on that? Uh, from my perspective, it, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish with your research project. I think that if it's a, a basic uh, research type of a project that you're submitting and requesting funding for, uh, it may make little to no difference. If it's an institutional uh, grant, mm -hmm. for example, yes. if we have we were submitting now a proposal for the NSF Advanced Grant, our program officers are now asking us now that the, because this is an institutional grant for which you've gotten funded, now you have a broader <laughs> campus, if you will. What are you going to do? to have the NSF uh, 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 grant impact uh, the folks in, in Brownsville, for example. So I, I think it depends on what's the purpose and goals of your, of your research. Uh, if it's an institutional grant, there's clearly, absolutely, uh, you have a responsibility to mention that in your grant because uh, you will be working uh, on that grant during the transition period to the new university. And in general, it's a, it's a good idea to provide uh, the reviewers with as much information that will benefit uh, your research proposal. Any other questions? So, so let me, if, if there are no questions, it's almost 1 o'clock, you have to leave. Before you leave, let me just kind of summarize. If you're interested in a particular area and you're looking for funding, the first thing you need to do is to identify the funding agencies that have a match with your idea. Find out the specific program that will fund that. You want to identify that as your first step. Once you have gone through that process, then you identify the program officers. And schedule a time, request via email, some time to talk to them on the phone. On the phone, they will share a lot of information with you. In writing, they will be very, very careful. Because remember, there's a conflict of interest issue there. They don't want to cross that line. And once you have had a conversation with a program officer, you've established that this is an area that they would be interested in funding. They might even tell you when the RFP is going to be coming out. So now you can be on the lookout when that RFP is coming out, NSF, NIH, or National Endowment for Humanities, and be watching that. Once that comes out, then the next thing is for you, abstract is the last thing you write. First do the proposal in a clear, concise way. There's an art in how you communicate your ideas. Don't get bogged down with the idea, I want to convince them and, and impress them with my science and the acronyms and the jargon. You want to make it as clear as, as you can possibly make it so that they can enjoy reading it all the way through the very end. Then you sit down and write the abstract such that you can create the wow factor. The minute they read the abstract, they say, this is interesting. This is different. I haven't seen anything like this before. They want to read the rest of it then. And in the budget part of it, you got to find a way in the budget justification to link the goals and the deliverables with what you're asking for. If you have too many people, 
they're working on it and the goals are not that large in scope, then the question will be raised, are we getting the return for our investment if we fund this? If the answer is no, then you will be turned down. So you want to find that balance and make sure you clearly articulate in the budget justification as to what you're going to be spending the money for, how that's going to help you deliver on the goals you promised. Okay? And start as early as you can. You heard that several times. The earlier you start, you can go through as many revisions as you want to. But if you start two weeks before that, you are going to be burning the midnight oil and still be making some mistakes because you'll be concentrating on the big picture and a little things will be overlooked inadvertently. And that's going to cost you a lot of money then. So let me pause here and thank, let's thank our panel members for, for their... <laughs> and thank you all. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we will be happy to assist you in our office or reach out other colleagues and we will be happy to facilitate your efforts. Thank you all.